Good evening, everybody, and welcome. I'm Alyssa Black. I'm the Interim Executive Director at Van Allen Institute. Van Allen Institute's proud to serve as co-presenter of the program this evening with the University at Buffalo School of Architecture and Planning. I'd like to begin by acknowledging this space that we're in. As we consider together this evening the topic of urban regeneration, we find ourselves surrounded by the timeless design of architect Kevin Roche here at the Ford Foundation Center for Social Justice. With Kevin's recent passing, we've lost a soulful and spirited advocate for architecture. This space is the result of a two-year transformation led by architecture and design firm Gensler that pays tribute to Roche's original vision while also celebrating the Ford Foundation's commitment to social justice through open, accessible, and sustainable design. These same values will be examined by us this evening together through the film internationally exhibited, See It Through Buffalo, which is a documentary short about the University at Buffalo architecture and planning school's work within the city of Buffalo across the last 50 years. Van Allen Institute, as a 125-year-old nonprofit organization, deeply shares the beliefs expressed in this film about the power of design to transform landscapes, cities and regions to improve the quality of people's lives. And with that, I'd like to hand you over to Corey Smith, who's the Professor and Chair of the Department of Architecture at the University of Buffalo, who will tell us more about the film. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Alyssa. And thanks to all of our hosts, organizers, and all of the panelists who are with us today. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. We're pleased to share with you See It Through Buffalo, a documentary short on the relationship between a university and its host city. The School of Architecture and Planning at the University at Buffalo was founded in the late 1960s, in the throes of the city's decline, as Buffalo experienced the loss of more than half its population and the decimation of its industry. Yet, out of this came a 50-year collaborative endeavor. Faculty and students working with the city's resilient citizenry to navigate the post-industrial transition. Filmed in 27 locations in late winter and early spring, See It Through Buffalo presents a pensive, yet hopeful, candid, yet intrepid, view of the city and the school and their conjoined histories. Scenes were shot predominantly using aerial and time-lapse cinematography and layered with the ambient sounds of each place and a custom score without narration. The film debuted at Time Space Existence, an exhibition in the context of the 2018 Venice Architecture Biennale, organized by the Global Art Affairs Foundation and the European Cultural Center. The film was directed by one of our faculty members, Gregory Delaney, and produced by John Padgett and his team <laughs> at First and Main Films. Uh, hopefully after the, the film view viewing, we'll be able to give them an even stronger and more robust applause. <laughs> um, I would also like to thank Robert Skirker, executive producer of the film, and extend my gratitude to Maddie Burke Vigeland uh, for her stewardship of this event. Tonight, we present the film as a moment of reflection. The film immerses you in the city's varied urban landscapes and complex histories. From vacant lots on the east side, to emergent sites along the waterfront, to new forms of architectural production. Through rust and revival, glory and grit, Buffalo has shaped us, and we have shaped Buffalo. Of course, parallels exist in other universities, other cities. So following the screening, we will merge our reflections on Buffalo with those of our esteemed panelists as each of their respective geographies enables us to more critically question 
and respond to issues of grand importance today, from affordable housing and food security to climate change and global migration. We look forward to our panel discussion, as well as the questions from all of you. Please enjoy the film.
Our panelists have many accolades, but in the interest of time, I will keep the introductions brief. On my immediate left, our moderator is Kathleen McGuigan, Editor-in-Chief of Architectural Record, which under her leadership has won the Grand Neal Award and the Top American Business Media Award for overall excellence. A former architecture critic and arts editor of Newsweek, Kathleen has taught at Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism and has been a Pointer Fellow at Yale. Starting on your far right on our panel, we have Deborah Burke, architect, educator, and dean of the Yale School of Architecture, where she has taught since 1987. She's founder of Deborah Burke Partners, whose works include, among many others, the Marianne Besky Gallery in New York, the Yale School of Art, and the 21C Museum Hotels across the US. Diane Davis is the Charles Dyer Norton Professor of Regional Development and Urbanism and Chair of Urban Planning and Design at Harvard's Graduate School of Design. Previously, Diane served as the head of the International Development Group at MIT. Trained as a sociologist, Diane's research engages the relationships among national development, urban governance, and urbanization. Robert Shibley has served as Dean of the School of Architecture and Planning at the University at Buffalo since 2011. Bob joined UB in 1982. Since then, his leadership in producing award-winning plans for Buffalo has spurred new investment and elevated public expectations for design and planning both in the city and across the globe. Since he is my boss, we're gonna begin with Bob. <laughs> Maybe. What's the magic here? Patience. Lots of patience. <laughs> of course, you all know we were here an hour and a half early and everything worked perfectly. <laughs> I'm going to start and hope for the best, but overall, we're looking at Buffalo as a legacy of landscapes and city futures. It's an environment where we know we have it. Thank you a tale of two cities. Two cities which on any given news cycle will suggest to you that we are on the comeback trail. Some would even suggest we've made it. And what I would have to say to you is those that suggest that don't live on Buffalo's east side. That the film captures a kind of truth in advertising that really requires us to see it through Buffalo. It offers a candid, but we think intrepid view of the trajectory of the city and school, and every segment of the film describes some aspect of our scholarship, where we see opportunity and where we see serious <coughs> challenge and learning in and with our community. The film is clearly not a promotion. It's meant to be an inquiry. What next? Where? What do I do with this? We know that these legacy landscapes and city futures are to be built upon, to be modified, with reverence, of course, but with aggression. We build on the legacy of Frederick Law Olmsted and Joseph Ellicott, who gave us America's second radial city and the best planned city in America, according to none other than Frederick Law Olmsted after he made it so. <laughs> Building on that legacy is intimidating, if not exhilarating and exciting. It is a, a beautifully laid out, good boned city that deserves our respect. Our students and faculty have built over two decades 
the physical planning infrastructure and urban design infrastructure that the city still follows today. This is a comprehensive plan, a downtown plan, an Olmsted Park and Parkway system, a redevelopment and management plan, and a waterfront plan. In order to put gas in the tank of those physical plans, our planning department, working through our urban design project, also developed uh, a, a regional institute. And out of that institute came a strategy for prosperity across five counties. It's an economic plan that has been adopted throughout those five counties in our economic district. The Buffalo Billion came as a function of the collaborations that made that plan and a regional plan developed for housing and urban development, uh, Department of Transportation and the Federal Highway Administration is all focused on sustainability in our city. Um, we work in Buffalo from the factory floor to the urban fabric. It's all led by students, adapted by municipalities and state agencies, but we are also makers. And in the maker space, we find ourselves in full collaboration with places like Rigidized Metals, where our students intern and now are employed, and where our faculty do performance-based research and innovations on the use of those metals. Parallel with that, you saw a similar example in Terracotta, where we focus on panels. We work and build in the city, with the city, with its industry, we are, as I suggested, reconstructing economies. And you can see the opportunity even as you see the challenge. This rail corridor surrounds our city, filled with the relics of an industrial past and a future cultural landscape to die for. A lot of work to do, but it's really powerful. The culture and industrial landscapes really intersect with a mobilizing practice, a democratic practice of architecture and planning that is bottoms up and middle out. We practice architecture and planning as a form of democratic action. Within that, we find ourselves, again, making. This home, for example, is, is a home that generates twice the energy it consumes. It's a show house for the general public and will soon become an energy education center. The windmills in the film all harken back to a time when Buffalo was the city of lights powered by the power from Niagara Falls. We've been there before. I'll finish with the notion that our city is a place of reflection and that our insertions in it are metaphors for the kind of collaborative action necessary to bring our cities back necessary for both our students and the people they would serve to understand where to and how to go next. How we think about planning and architecture is embedded in a wide variety of places. But think for a moment about that swing and understand that it's not going anywhere if it's not together. <laughs> as an installation created by just, uh, uh, jo um, I'm sorry, jo Julia, J it's a J, I got that part. <laughs> Julia Jamrazic and uh, her partner, Corin Kempstedt. Those places of reflection suggest that the swing in installation needs partnership, needs a way of understanding how to work. And if we follow to the next installation by the same couple, we see a place that allows you to swing but be aware of everyone around you all the time. They call it the round table. It's a metaphor for how we work with our university and across our university. It's a metaphor for how we work in it with our community and neighborhoods. It's where we work in state, national, and international places. The focus of our work is always local and global. Um, at the same time, it's challenged and we are made by where we live every day. Thank you. Yeah, good luck. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
I just want to say that I, I'm so pleased to be here. I think the whole the focus of the evening should be on the amazing things that you've done in Buffalo. It's a beautiful film, and what you're doing in the university is a model and aspirational for many universities. And I wish I could say that Harvard Graduate School of Design has um, met the challenge in the way that you have, but it has not yet, which isn't to say that we don't have aspirations and we're going to be moving towards that. So I'm using this as an opportunity to say a little more about where we're heading at the, at the GSD. Um, many of you know that GSD is an extremely global university. A lot of our students and faculty come from around the world and it's always prided itself on being a very global university. But since I became chair of the Department of Planning and Design, we've seen a move more towards working in our own backyard. So we are actually putting a lot of attention on working in both Cambridge and Boston. I'm going to say a little, just a little bit about what we're doing. Let me just begin, though, by saying that I, I, I believe that we have similar aspirations as, as um, the team uh, d does at, the, at Buffalo University, thinking about the university as a catalyst for change, for urban change, and thinking and using a co-learning model, which involves student and faculty on one hand with stakeholders in the city and the region, which I, you've done in the Buffalo. Uh, example, and I've read a lot of the background materials, not just got this from the film. I also wanted to add that I think we might have a similar history in that it was interesting that you've been working at this for 50 years, you've mentioned. Um, and that's, if we th were thinking about the late 60s, it just so happens that at the GSD in the late 60s, the great advocacy planner, Chester Hartman started initiatives working in communities in Boston in 1968. That experiment had a checkered history. I'll tell anybody else about that later. Um, we kind of lost that for a while. Um, maybe that's why it went global or the focus on the, our own backyard, thinking about struggles of, over urban renewal, the South End, so many important political struggles that were happening in cities all around the United States in the late 60s. So I find it interesting that in a way there's a temporality to the story that we're telling. And maybe it's worth thinking about um, the history in light of the present. So if we are going to be coming back, we at the GST coming back with the advocacy work in the local neighborhoods around Boston in the ways that were initiated by Chester Hartman, in 68, and as you started in, in the late 60s in Buffalo, we have to remember that the cities are very different now than they were in 1968. So that's a point that I'd like to make. I think we should be thinking a little more about why uh, the kind of new charges for universities and not just the old charges, and they have to do with thinking about climate change and sustainability um, and the, the fact that economic and gro growth and prosperity in cities, regions, and even nations is very much tied to economic globalization and the decline of manufacturing and all the issues that you're looking at in Buffalo. Every city in the United States is affected by that, but some cities are thriving under economic globalization and some cities are declining. Um, and I think that what's interesting for us in Boston is that we're a city that's very different from Buffalo, but we really want to get involved in our backyard, but we need to actually take our tools, our frameworks, and focus on what are the, not only the problems, but the opportunities to intervene in a city like Boston that's very different than bu Buffalo. Um, let me just say, okay, I do have some slides here. Buffalo, Boston is a very affluent so we don't have the kind of burned out neighborhoods. We definitely have pockets of poverty and neglect and displacement, but in the larger scale of things, we are dealing with an embarrassment of riches in a way in which there's poverty and inequality and racism and issues of climate change, mobility justice, et cetera, that are peppered through the city itself. So this means that any kind of intervention probably is not gonna be the comprehensive approach that I see <coughs> Buffalo taking, because in a sense, you're trying to kind of reconfigure the relationship between all the parts in a dynamic way and you know, strategically thinking with a comprehensive plan. But in a case like Boston, I would say that we are a divided, it's a, it's a divided city and a divided region. Not just divided because you have pockets of poverty 
and neglect in a very affluent city with, hot, with lots of development and high property values. But we also have a split between the region around Boston and the city of Boston itself. Now I know you're looking at the metropolitan area, but the relationship between the city of Boston where the money and the investment is and the, the kind of areas around Boston is totally different than in the, than in the Buffalo area. Um, and in particular, an issue that I look at a lot in my own work, the politics of that relationship is also very different. Boston is a very small city with a lot of power focused in the mayor and the Boston planning or redevelopment of authority, but most of the challenges to deal with the divided, divided region, the inequalities, the environmental problems are dependent on relationships out in and outside of Boston, Boston with its neighboring cities. So what does that mean for what we're doing at the GSD? I'm a chair of a department that has two different programs and I'm gonna say something about both of the programs are approaching those challenges in the Boston metro area in slightly different ways. We have an urban design program which is a post-professional degree so all the students in that program are architects. And they actually for the first time this year in all the years I've been there and, for a, and since a long, a long time ago has focused their urban design studio not on New York not on Chicago, but on Boston. So this, these are some photos of the kind of work that our students are doing in the Boston area. And I want to mention that in the urban design studio, they have kind of disaggregated the city of Boston into three kind of zones of kind of a transitional core, a semi-periphery, and a, a far periphery, even in with the city of Boston. And what that means is we have to teach our students how to think strategically with acupunctural um, interventions and thinking about projects that catalyze changes as a whole. Again, not a big comprehensive change, but strategic investments and strategic interventions in different sites in the entire city to kind of uh, reformulate the relationship of the parts of the whole. Then in our planning studio, um, we have uh, two semesters of, of um, work, and we have a student here from our program who can answer some questions later as well. But in the fall, we teach students the history of planning seen through the lens of some of the important work that's been done in Boston itself. You mentioned Olmsted, but if you think about the city of Boston, a lot of what is in the fabric of our city is a consequence of the interventions of a lot of major architects, planners, landscape architects, the Dudley, uh, the Dudley Street Initiative, and then we have like the kind of West End renovation. We have Kevin Lynch, we have Ed Logue, we have, again, Olmsted, et cetera. But on the other hand, there are plenty of problems that are associated with the work that they've done, and so our students actually study a little bit about the history of our planning through the lens of Boston. Then in the second semester, they focus on one community in an area that we call a gateway city. It's usually outside of the city of Boston, but it can be inside the city of Boston, where the concentrations of poverty, inequality, um, and other major urban challenges um, are, are on the minds of both citizens as well as local officials. Um, and I think that one of the things that I wanted to you know, kind of put on the table for discussion is that in our core planning studio in the second semester on what we call gateway cities, this is where I think there's a parallel between what's happening in Buff Buffalo and what we're doing in the gateway cities. However, the difference is, and again, this is something possibly we could speak about, is the ways in which it's not just that you can say, okay, what you do in Buffalo might work in Quincy and might work in Lowell and might work in Revere and might work in Chelsea, but how does intervening in one of those areas change the metropolitan region. So one of the things that I, that I think we need to transcend in our field of, of planning and design is the focus maybe only on a single city or a single neighborhood. We constantly want to think about how does intervening in one part of the built environment affect another part of the built environment. Last, I would say um, that through this work, through our, both of the core studios in urban design and planning, even if we can't take on the initiative that a place like the University of Buffalo has taken on with a, a concerted effort by the university and the city, 
And I, I have some ideas about why that doesn't happen. We've got lots of great universities in the Boston area. So in a way, you have what Gershenko would say, the advantages of backwardness, dare I say that, but you have one <laughs> major university can work with a city. In Boston, we have so much talent, so many universities, but that fragments the capacity to create a single relationship that may not be good for Boston. Uh, but the point I wanted to make here is that all the universities are doing what they can in small ways, uh, and maybe we'll have to think about coordinating more, but out of those kind of small studio projects, what we end up doing is inspiring our students to take the, the, the mantle on their own. And many of our students go on and develop projects that came out of a relationship they established with the, the neighborhoods in the Gateway Court planning studio. There's a, I can tell you about many of them later. I want to go on too long. This is my last slide. Um, we also have a community service fellowship, so it's really m a lot of the work is done individually by students who are inspired by what they get in the classroom and they take it forward. They see it through on their own and maybe we have to work more to get the larger institutional context like you're doing in Buffalo. And last, I do want to announce that I'm s s very pleased that we are starting, we're going back to the years of Chester Hartman and we just got seed funding from our dean to start a community design and learning initiative in Boston. So we are gonna be back, back on track uh, at the GSD and maybe we'll be able to follow in the footsteps of some of the work that you've done in Buffalo as we unfold that community design and learning initiative over the next couple years. Thanks. <laughs>
And under my leadership, we are now partnering with an organization called Columbus House, a not-for-profit founded actually by a woman graduate of the Yale Divinity School that provides services and facilities for the homeless population in New Haven. Uh, the first year class at Yale in the MARC One program, roughly 55 students, together design and then build a house that belongs to Columbus House. Uh, the two you see here, one completed in the summer of 18, the other in the summer of 17, are both tiny two-family houses. Uh, the small two-bedroom unit is conceived for a single mother and her child or children, and the attached studio unit is for a single person, typically a homeless veteran, what we learned from the wonderful people at Columbus House is uh, once you give somebody a place to live, they're no longer homeless, and that curse of identification of homelessness is taken off of them. In the bottom two images, um, you see the students building the house. We've been experimenting with various forms of prefabrication since, uh, since I started as dean to get away from stick built as the only model of construction. The image at the bottom on uh, the right shows the CLT panels being craned in, um, and the other image shows pre-built panels that were built uh, away from the site being tilted up um, and bolted together. And in the image on the top right, uh, the woman at the microphone is the mayor of New Haven, Tony Harp, uh, whether you like her politics or not. Uh, she always comes to our opening events, uh, and she, I am proud to say she is a graduate of the Yale School of Architecture. And a good example, I believe, of uh, getting away from the idea uh, that everybody who practices architecture has to practice in a traditional narrow definition of capital A architecture, but rather there are broad ways in which people trained as architects can influence and change their communities, and that includes elected office. Um, as part of the building project, which is a required course in our curriculum, students last year created this pavilion, which they called the Homeless Housed. They built it for the annual International Festival of Ideas, uh, of Arts and Ideas, which happens each summer on the New Haven Green. Their idea was to educate New Haven residents about homelessness and housing affordability in the New Haven area. So residents came, often with their children, to speak to the students. The students listened to stories. Uh, shared stories about dealing with homelessness, they took oral histories, and then they studied and shared with visitors to the pavilion facts and figures about housing vacancy, average rents, affordability, and the home ownership statistics in the area. Last year, a lot of elementary school children regularly came to the structure and drew their visions of what a house should be like. Um, it was a very, very popular uh, piece in the Arts and Ideas Festival. Uh, so the pavilion which the students built is demountable, will be used again this year, again in parallel with, with the house which gets built over the course of the summer. The School of Architecture also has uh, an organization we call the Urban Design Workshop, which is a faculty-led study center that provides planning and design services to neighborhood community, neighboring communities, I should say, across Connecticut and New England. This project is called Resilient Bridgeport, and it looks at ways to manage storm surge and sea level rise. Uh, came about after Hurricane Sandy. In 2013, the federal Rebuild by Design competition was announced to gather new ideas to deal with the devastating effects of things like Sandy and the other challenges presented by climate change and sea level rise, wave surge, heavy rainfall, et cetera. So with the support of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, a multidisciplinary team was uh, selected to work with the city of Bridgeport that included and was led by the Yale Urban Design Workshop. So they're now, we're several years in, and they're deep into developing a strategic plan to reduce flood risk and improve resilience across Bridgeport's most vulnerable areas where, where the impoverished population lives. It relies on green resilience strategies like perimeter surge protection, dry egress, green infrastructure, stormwater management, and utility microgrids. It's also a comprehensive design, urban design framework, so includes strategies for urban development, neighborhood connections, and local and regional transit. It's been a lot of engagement with state and municipal agencies, never easy, rarely fun, but uh, essential to getting this kind of work done. And I would say despite 
I'm just going to say it. Despite current national conditions and attitudes, uh, we're optimistic about this actually being fully implemented and succeeding. The UDW has also had, right in New Haven, an ongoing collaboration with the Dwight neighborhood that began back in 1992 with the development of a comprehensive neighborhood plan. And then since the plan's implementation has resulted in a number of significant projects, including a daycare center and offices completed with, uh, in collaboration with a local architecture firm, the 10,000 square foot facility for 60 infants and toddlers, as well as two adult education for parenting uh, classrooms and new office space for the Greater Dwight Development Corporation. And UDW continues to be the go-to design and planning and advisory support group for that neighborhood and other neighborhoods in New Haven and, and surrounding cities. Um, as many people know, uh, the architect Frank Gehry re regularly teaches an advanced design studio at Yale as a visiting professor. You see him there with his hands like this, with the blue scarf. Um, and although he's known for his work designing concert halls and significant signature buildings around the world, his studio at Yale last year, done in collaboration with an organization called Impact Justice, as well as members of the Yale Law School faculty, was to redesign the Cheshire State Prison in Connecticut for a future without mass incarceration as we know it today. I do not believe architects can change our criminal justice system. Frank doesn't either. Uh, but having the students work with law students, meet the formerly incarcerated, and take on the challenge of the built aspects of incarceration and how it could be better was a fascinating and inspirational design studio. And through that studio, we met the people at Impact Justice. As I said, it's, a, it's actually a San Francisco-based organization working to change uh, the patterns of American incarceration. Uh, so Frank's studio only had 10 students in it, but this second year required core design studio had 60 students in it with six faculty members divided into six sections. And they designed restorative justice centers in three troubled Connecticut cities, Bridgeport, Middletown, and New London. And these centers specifically accommodate what's known in restorative justice as the circle process, which is its central practice, uh, which is you resolve crimes collectively as a group within a community. Um, so the students work closely with neighborhood community groups, legal aid lawyers, anti-recidivism experts as they develop their projects. On this slide, you can see a site visit, a workshop at the school with representatives from community organizations from throughout Connecticut. They were speaking about their experiences with restorative justice and diverting people away from the criminal justice system as it functions today. One of our visitors includes Deanna Van Buren speaking to students about mass incarceration in the United States. That's in the middle image. And Impact Justice staff members speaking to students. And at the bottom right is the final review. A good place for me to make my final sentence um, and end the presentation so we can get to the questions. Uh, but uh, my final comment is to say that I think schools of architecture must be involved with their communities. Um, and there are many, many ways for them to do that, as you see from the three of us, uh, and to have an ongoing impact. So thank you. Well, there certainly is a great deal of variety. Uh, uh, Diana and I were talking earlier. Um, I had an experience at, as a Loeb Fellow at the GSD about 20 odd years ago, and there wasn't this kind of impulse in the schools then. I think that's also true of we're in a cycle and we've cycled back. So what's particularly impressive about Buffalo is how long you have been at this. And I would argue that you're not, that you're, you're doing both treating the entire body with your master plan as well as doing acupuncture. I'm proud to say that Architectural Record published that uh, round table swing as well as having published the hotel the, in the H.H. H. Richardson Building and the Darwin Martin House and Toshiko Mori's Visitor <laughs> Center. We did that swing. But I think we'd all like to hear a little bit more, though, actually about um, in this perhaps unique position where you are the university in Buffalo and you created this master plan and you got buy-in from uh, the local officials. And this is, this is what 
the city has been operating under. I wish you could tell us a little bit more about the specifics and particularly the economic regeneration plan part of it. Well, um, so. Big question. The first talk was four minutes long and this was gonna <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I will, I will, I will do it briefly because I really also want to hear from my colleagues, but I, I, I think it's important to understand that it's a, essentially a trust building exercise. We started many, many years ago. In fact, our origin story is we didn't have enough money to have a school. And so we practiced as practitioner educators and practitioner students and practitioner chairs and deans. And in those practice engagements, we built trust in a community and it grows from there. A, a, an acupuncture piece here and an acupuncture piece there and, an, and a recognition of their relationship starts to almost de facto evolve that kind of understanding about a broader place. And out of that, I think we were then invited to um, think about how you deal with a dysfunctional kind of governance, uh, i.e. I don't trust the government to do the right thing, we're still on a slide down. I don't trust my business community to do the right thing, we're still on a slide down. Where do you turn to for someone who can be a fair and honest broker about what's in the way and what's got to move? And they turned to us because we built that trust over decades. Mm -hmm. And that was the origin. We didn't start to do a master plan that started out in downtown. We started to continue to teach architecture and planning the way we had been and introduce the urban design conceits in that. And in the process of helping mediate those discussions at the request of both the business community and the governance community, we, we suddenly found ourselves with almost a plan. So we finished it. And that launched the, wow, that was good. Can you do a comprehensive plan? Gee, how about our landscape and an Olmstead plan and so forth? And they all came from different sources of funding. But once you have the trust, don't lose it. <laughs> And, and still run right into the teeth of it when you have to. And I think they just trust us to tell the truth about things. That's kind of what academics are supposed to do. So I would say just do what you do well and keep doing it, but, but recognize that it's not just this and walk away. We, as practitioner, we often have to do the job and then the job's over and we stop getting paid and we move on to the next one. We're not still there. But the University of Buffalo is not going to North Carolina anytime soon. <laughs> We're there, yeah. and the school is there. And just as a footnote to that, there are 33 universities in our region, <laughs> and, and they don't work together any either. better than yours. <laughs> but, but I think the aspiration is there. Mm -hmm. that, uh, when you sort of paint the target, you can get more people shooting at it. Um, so is that I, helpful? It, it is, but how has it worked? I mean, there's the suggestion that that uh, Buffalo is beginning to turn around, that it stopped losing population. You talked about, you know, all of these kind of extraordinary industrial buildings that we see across the country, these former industrial buildings becoming cultural um, incubators. And is that, it, what, what is gonna drive, what is driving this regeneration? Well, so. I mean, how many artists? Sure. It's gonna take a hell of a lot of artists to. <laughs> save a city, but uh, it's a great idea. <laughs> the, the, the notion that we are saving the city is, 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 is an anathema to the recognition that there are thousands of people toiling in that vineyard every day. I mean, that's, that's the truth of it. We have, the, I think, the sensibility to recognize that without them, we're not doing hardly anything. In the course of making those early plans, we built enough trust that when the governor said there's going to be 10 economic districts in the state. <laughs> he made it up. And you're going to work with these five counties. Uh, okay, we don't usually work together, but we'll try. And you walk into that room with 33 some odd citizens from places all appointed by the governor and or the municipalities. And your job is in five months to produce an economic plan that you can believe in. And then you're going to compete across the state who do you call? <laughs> they called us. 
So we worked with them to try and fashion an economic development plan. Or we did the market sector analysis. We figured out where Buffalo had unique contributions to make and where we should stop. <laughs> and, and, and fashion, with a lot of help from a lot of people, a, a kind of uh, eight sector plan, uh, which reduced when it got to Buffalo itself in the Buffalo Billion Opportunity Three. We won the statewide competition. A lot of money came down the freeway. I thought, Whew, well, we're done. And literally, the governor turned around and said, look, we have to bring the second largest city in New York State back. Here's a billion. Show me what you can do with it. And so we went right back into that mode, again, at their invitation, because we just had a success, and they trusted to do us. Another half got added to that, and there's lots of torture in all of this, but you, you work with the folks <laughs> yes. you have to work with. And, and I, I got to tell you, I haven't met any of them I dislike. They're all working very hard to try and do the right thing. The last piece of this pleases me the most, and that's when they decided to, well, that Buffalo billion and a half was good. How about Rochester and Syracuse and other places across the state? And so we wrote and leveled the playing field across all of upstate as part of the process by which you engage your publics and lay in the economic foundation that'll feed this. It's not architecture, except Every day we argued with the economic planners, it matters where you put it and how you put it. And so you get to have those conversations while you go. Is that, I, again, yeah, I don't want to take too much. You're also talking about how there, this can be a model for other places. Some places are like Buffalo, other places aren't. One of the things that's interesting is that you're an institution and you're a stable institution as are your universities. But the students come and go, and it was interesting, Deborah's remark that the mayor of New Haven is a former architecture student. So how do you keep having a new crop? And one of the things that strikes me is maybe they do go to the meetings with all of these government people. That's a good experience. But they're also the ones who go into the neighborhoods, right? And how does that work in each of your cases? Because those are the stakeholders you really have to persuade are those people in the community that you're not going to impose on them, you're going to work with them, right? Maybe Deborah and Diane could talk about that a little bit. Well, um, one of the things that we're um, discussing with the new Community Design and Learning Initiative is exactly this issue. How do we, I mean, how do we develop activities that are not exploitative of the communities or that we just allow our students to go in, learn something and leave, etc. So one of the reasons that we push so hard for this is it institutionalizes a presence. Students will come and go, but the kind of institute will have a presence. We're also working with the Boston Foundation because they have a new program where they're going to fund community leaders and then we'll pair our students with the leaders. So, I mean, I think it's a, it's a matter of institutionalizing those, those relationships. Universities can be an important part of that, but also you have to be in that liminal space between the university, that institution of, of like, design de development and, and the community itself. If I could say one more thing just in response to your, maybe it's more a comment listening to your answers about you know the, the experiment and the business community, et cetera, et cetera. What strikes me is a very power, what is powerful about the model is the way in which this was essentially a crisis moment. Crisis is something that's too good to wa waste, right? A crisis moment where the public sector, the private sector, and the university were able to work together. And that's something that I think, not that there aren't plenty of cr crises in the Boston area, that maybe we should be looking more at some of the locations where things are so bad that you force a collaboration among actors that don't always work together. And I actually think that's a very important lesson for students in planning and design schools. It's not just the ideas they have, but what are what is the kind of politics of getting every together to try to experiment and support each other? And I would say that one of the wonderful things about the education at Buffalo is that students have an opportunity to be there in that, that environment. That's a better, um, that's probably, I don't want to say it's a better education than the graduate school of design. Or, <laughs> you know, but that is a special opportunity for students who care about changing the cities that they live in to go to an institution that has that partnership. So I mean, it really benefits everybody who's involved in the partnership. So I think it's really great. We'll look for some more crises in the Boston area to make sure we can get some more <laughs> stakeholders together to support us. 
But I think what you're saying about um, building continual, continuous relationships with local organizations allows the transitory nature of the students to not matter all that much over the long term. So this Columbus House relationship, even though the building project is a tiny little thing, it's not planning one thing a year where three or four people will live, but it's been happening for a long time. What's interesting about engaging with the community is the reason the students built the pavilion on the New Haven Green is because they were going to build the Columbus House project in an uh, impoverished neighborhood that didn't want it, who, where the community members mm. basically said, we have it tough enough. Don't you bring us homeless people? We don't want this here. It's hard where we are, and don't make it harder. And the students had to engage in conversations and actually took on essentially informing the city about the conditions in the city so that there could be greater involvement. And it took doing that to be able to get a building per permit to do the project. And in some ways, as important as building the house was, just building a house. Seeing how the machinations of community engagement with, uh, with the planning process was probably a more valuable lesson and may change the shape of a few people's careers as they make decisions based on that. It's really interesting. Um, I'm a little concerned that we have a little time to talk Got questions from the audience? Yes. Take some time. Pardon? Take some time. No, no, I think <laughs> that's important because um, I think this could be. Um, I think this should be a conference for a whole weekend. I could go on and on. I have a lot I want to know, but I, I, I hope some more will come out from questions from all of you. And there are microphones or a microphone? Microphones, microphones in, on each side. <coughs> Does anybody want? to make a comment, a question, question better than a comment, if you could, please. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I'm Suzanne Mushow, and I am a graduate of University of Buffalo, and I'm one of those students who really um, benefited from the relationship with the community and doing multiple projects, basically every studio involved working with the city. And I can tell you, and I don't mean anything at any disrespect, but it was not out of crisis. It was completely out of opportunity. And uh, what was always amazing was every time you worked with a different community, they were just interested in the ideas. And so my question is, as I watched the film, I was thinking to myself, you know, no one goes to architecture school because they know something. It's because they know absolutely nothing. <laughs> and and what I'm, I would love to hear from you, what do you think about that concept of basically knowing nothing, doing the idea making with no answers, and then finding solutions uh, for really the world's issues? I think it's actually something that as architects, we really, we really feel that we have sort of the corner on the market and um, just would love to hear from you. Who's that addressed to? <laughs> anyone, anyone. I think we so don't have the corner on the ideas market that the strength of some of the things that we're doing, and I think all the schools are doing really great projects, is as much involved with making sure that the architects talk to the lawyers, the people from the divinity school, the people from the school from public health. They don't have all the answers either, but collectively they get closer to the answers, and so that piece of the university environment also helps, which is there are lots of informed people who care, and we should all be learning how to work together uh, rather than in isolation and sort of solo pursuit of any answers. One thing I would add, I think it's in response to that question, and I agree with you, I don't mean a crisis in a negative way, it's an opportunity. Right. Um, is in my own work, I, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not an architect, but one of the things that I always ask my students to do whenever they take a class with me and I teach on governance and politics and planning, et cetera, is to always focus on one place and focus deeply on one place. No matter where it is, I focus on Mexico. Whatever problem I'm interested in, I always want to kind of 
reflect on that problem, reflect on a skill set, reflect on a technique, knowledge, debate, et cetera, in the context of a single place so that you can know deeply and know really well. So I think this is what I'm, I'm hearing from you. This is the advantage when you said that all your studios are somewhere Another related to Buffalo. It could be with a community, it could be with a local business person and with the arts community. But through engaging one city in the multiplicity of scales that you need to think about it and the multiple actors, building on what Deborah says, you are going to get a type of a knowledge that you won't get if you're asking general things. So I don't actually believe that students come knowing nothing. But what they, they maybe know one thing, and the advantage of being in an experiment like this one is that they just magnify their knowledge by interacting with other people around the same place with a different perspective. And I think that is very valuable. And one of the things, we have amazing studios at the GSD, but they're all over the world. So what we're trying to do now is constantly focus on the same even if it's not the same neighborhood, the same city over and over and over again because you deepen your knowledge and you become, a, I think, a better architect, planner, urban designer by knowing one place well. I, 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 thanks, Suzanne. I, I, I cringed a little when you said no, nothing, because you're one of the smartest people on the planet. But, but I think that notion of imagination is right. And I also want to challenge this notion of that we're just in Buffalo. That is not where yeah. we are. We, we're a major yeah, public just, research yeah. university. We act our, every major public research university. We want to climb in the ranks of that university. You're not going to do that if you just stay in Buffalo. You're going to have to take your lessons from here somewhere else and hopefully you take them in a way that someone can situate those lessons, which is what you're doing in your practice now, and I think many of our graduates do. It's, it's about knowledge situated or constructed in place. So it's easier to step outside your door and construct that knowledge and make things, but it's not imperative. You can do that. My, Corey just got back from Africa. We're, we're, we're in India. We do food system security across the United States in terms of policy and design interventions in neighborhoods. But we do come back to the city over and over again because we're a public school and it's an inexpensive laboratory and we don't have to fly all over the world to get to it. And so we, we try to balance that perspective of local and global but ultimately, I think what you learned to do was construct knowledge in place, expert knowledge and local knowledge in dialogue. There's Somebody still mics. else? Hi, um, I'm Madeline. I'm a graduate of the Urban Planning School. Um, and I had a question about how you guys look at internal advocacy within your institutions, right? So I participated a lot in the community programming that existed at UB. Um, but I wonder about how, as deans, you look at your institutions as their own forces of, you know, their impact on gentrification, their impact of development. And so it's wonderful to have community programming, it's essential, but how do you, as deans, look to your other partners, whether it's in the medical school on the east side or, um, you know, other institutions in the university to advocate for these same principles of equitable development? Wow, good question. <laughs> Hard question. I would imagine that Yale's relationship with New Haven is a little bit different than Harvard's relationship with Cambridge, although there might be some parallels, neither pay taxes, um, <laughs> which is an issue. Um, I would say, at an, it's a really smart and interesting question. For us, Yale University's relationship with New Haven is uh, complex and complicated. Uh, and not always good. It's, I think, been better recently than, say, 40, 50, 60 years ago. Um, but the School of Architecture's relationship with New Haven has always been pretty good, and some of that comes out of the building project or students teaching uh, as volunteers in the public schools. Or So uh, one, as dean, I'm trying to balance that, maintaining our good relationship with the neighborhoods in which we work with uh, the perception of the university in some of those communities. And the other is working uh, in dialogue at Yale anyway, the, the deans, there are 15 deans in the whole university, we're a pretty close-knit group, we try to support each other, is to have conversations about 
what individual schools are doing that is succeeding and how we can learn from each other. And those might be separate, smaller undertakings than anything the larger university is doing. Deborah, I loved uh, in a, our discussion earlier when you described uh, you, you are a school of architecture in the university at Yale. So you're, you've got, you, you almost are forced out to have that collaboration. I just have planning and feel kind of naked with just two relative to what the rest of the university offers. So we build centers and we build kind of intentional collaborations. We have one with engineering and, uh, and sustainable manufacturing and advanced robotics because we have a cadre of faculty whose intellectual project is really wrapped around that aspect of making and, and making it in the way it's gonna happen 10 or 15 years from now and trying to get there. We have another group in global health equity, which is public health, um, um, the College of Arts and Sciences, engineering, architecture, and planning, jointly governed across that spectrum and, and seated and funded and a consortium of 100 faculty who participate and they're headquartered in our building. So it's, it's like, what's it? We, we focus on a grand challenge like food. <laughs> How are we going to feed the world and food systems? And then what are all the disciplines necessary to make that work and go get it? And, and that's, that's from a university perspective. So that's one answer to the advocacy question. I thought you were going somewhere else, which is what about, as you did, Deborah, the relationship between the university as a whole and the community where it resides? And like I suspect both of your institutions, we've had a checkered history in that. But the intellectual project in architecture and planning has been from its start that notion of, boy, we live in an environment that desperately needs to think about a regenerative culture and a resilient way of living in one form or another. And we're going to have to get there. And much of the intellectual project, even as it might apply globally, has to happen here too. <laughs> So for us, that helps, I think, consolidate the advocacy, at least from within the school. And over time, our, the, the, school, the university itself has kind of fluctuated in its relationship locally. I would just add to this. So I'm not a dean, so I'm not responsible for any of these things. <laughs> <laughs> so everything I say is from the peanut gallery. But um, yes, Harvard has a checkered history. I mean. What's interesting about the, our location is we're in Cambridge, but now we have a property in Boston. It's a very politically complicated um, relationship. Of course, if we think back to how I started out the presentation, the Boston and the Cambridge area is filled with affluence. Universities contribute to that. Our economy is very strong. All the kind of things you're trying to develop there, we have, you know, specialized manufacturing. We have the IT economy of real estate development, et cetera. And the universities are not the sole con contribution to that, but they are a part of that picture. So it's a very complicated relationship. We've done tried to do some work with the Cambridge Community Foundation. We, the head of the Community Foundation, is a graduate of our urban design program. But it's a very, it's a difficult relationship. We can do it kind of one on one between our department and these kind of advocacy groups. What Harvard can do and will do, should and would do is a whole nother story. So, uh, and that's a super yes. complicated, but what we can do at the, at, in the urban planning and design program is do the best we can with our ethics, our values, our commitment to planning, and just try to keep, you know, keep moving forward. The other thing I want to say about the kind of interaction, so internal interaction of the university as well as kind of outside with the, the our host communities, <clears throat> One of the, th I, I, I'm stuck on this idea of advantages and disadvantages. You know, you're stuck with structural conditions and you're gonna turn them into something positive, but they can also be a constraint. One of the interesting things I would say, reflecting on the Graduate School of Design, is we have so many, it's so old and so long with such a reputation. First with architecture, we have landscape architecture, we have urban planning and design. So we have like four programs, all are very strong. In some ways that forces us to kind of not cooperate among ourselves in ways that we could. I think if we were just one pro program, maybe we would be making more bridges outside than we have been. I would like to say though that we are moving in that direction. As I mentioned to you, Deborah, we have now a joint degree with the uh, School of Public Health. There's a joint degree with the law school. There is a joint 
many of our students get a joint degree with the Kennedy School, but the newest program that we have, which I think speaks to where Harvard is going and where Harvard sees the GSD is fitting into the university, which it didn't really, I don't think, appreciate what we were doing very much in the past, is we have a new program in a master in design engineering between the engineering school and the design school. So there are all sorts of opportunities and uh, to kind of make new connections and hopefully, from my perspective, that will shake up the siloing within the school because I think our programs are more siloed than they should be and I like to hear you guys are doing amazing things. I wish we could get more cooperation internal to the school. I, I've been amazed at the leadership of our university of, literally over the last several decades because it has made that part of its agenda. Mm -hmm. It believes in yeah. the necessity to bring many disciplines together. All of us can solve problems that no one of us can solve by ourselves. And, and the fact that that's policy that's then rewarded by the university's <coughs> institutional structures has, I think, yielded the University of Buffalo great dividends. Um, and, um, that's the end of my paid commercial, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm quite serious about it. If you think about it, w the holy grail of all of our institutions is shouldn't we be able to connect together the, the right. complex array of disciplines necessary to solve these grand challenges? But almost never can we figure out how to stop fighting over how many students in my classroom as opposed to yours, because that's money. Right. And how do you think about those kinds of divisions in a way that isn't competitive or combative, more to the point? And I think the way we've done it is to reward the groups, not the individual departments in that same way. I think we have time for one more, if somebody has a question. Maybe everybody wants a glass of wine. Oh, no. Oh, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> after you, we got a glass of wine. What a relief. I can really uh, 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 enunciate this well, but I'm just wondering, you know, the architecture school and the planning schools, you're always going out into the community. So I'm just wondering if there's ever an effort to bring the community into the university so that they really understand the economic, the development forces that are happening, so they really understand what's happening, you know, the larger things that are making the moves, the gentrification, or the disinvestment that they're experiencing? It's a, a lovely question, and I think all three of us will, will have probably similar answers. We, we certainly extend that invitation. We have something we call the Community Planning School that was started out of our One Region Forward sustainability effort almost a decade ago. We bring um, a, a, a class of folks across the diverse eight-county region uh, with rural, poor, uh, urban, suburban, uh, self-selected, and run a semester-length kind of sequence of, of weekend events. And then out of that pull ch champions who come with projects about their individual community and then construct and mentor a dialogue across that. In parallel with that, we started a new real estate development program almost precisely because of what your question was about. If we were going to bring our most depressed areas up, we're not going to do it by bringing developers from outside, putting them in, developing and taking the money out. We're going to do it by building wealth there. And to do that, you need those strip owners and commercial folks to be able to develop that real estate for themselves and hold the wealth in their community, in their neighborhood. So teaching that has got to be a kind of core enterprise as well. So we're trying to build a whole new generation of essentially real estate developers who are bracketed with planning policy and architecture, not just free ring, go get the money. And hopefully with some of the values that come from the kind of education that all three of us have been talking about. That's really great answer. Good answer. Yeah. <laughs> Well, this and is it's a great question. I just want to say it is a very important question. It's yeah. always easy to kind of look at it from our perspective, how we can help the community. And that's one of the, as I mentioned earlier, one of the dilemmas. Like, how do we make sure that it's really a two-way exchange and that everybody is involved in setting the agenda together as opposed to one versus the other? And I think... If I could take just one more second, I'd like to point again to Greg Delaney, John Padgett, Corey Don Smith, 
um, and um, who am I leaving out in that? Bob Skirker, yes. Uh, as kind of a core team without whom this film, our first trip to Venice and the Viennale experience and this discussion wouldn't have been as rich. So thank you again for a tremendous effort. Thank you for that. Thank you. And thank you to the three panelists. It's really been a very inspiring uh, discussion, which we can continue in the garden. Drinks. <laughs> <laughs>